which is joining hands with Antarila for the first time in this lovely space. Uh, so, it's great to do this thing here for the first time. Uh, inviting you, as you all know, to the Bangalore launch of Parvati's uh, Shikshama's novel, first novel, and Mihir Vasan's first poetry collection. So, it's like a double debut. So, uh, to talk, to tell you about uh, Mihir first. He's a poetry editor of. I can never get my. Bye, yeah. Okay. And the winner of the Purple Award for writing in English, as well as the Srinivas Bayapur Poetry Prize. He lives and writes in his hometown, Hazaribad, in Japan. Painting that red circle, white, or the dress, is his first published collection of poetry. We also have. Oh, I have to say, welcome, Vivian. Okay. Formally. Okay. Uh, we also have Parvati Sharma, whose first novel it is, but not her first book, because some of us have, at least some of us at least, have uh, read her Dead Camel and other stories of her, which was published in 2010. Uh, she's a writer based in Delhi, where she's lived for the last 20 odd years, and close to home is her debut novel. So, welcome to the And to talk to both of them, we have Anjum Hassan, the ideal person to talk to both of them because she's not only a poet, but a novelist herself. So, which means that she, we expect a very nice interaction after their readings and, you know, reading out from their work with uh, Anjum. And I don't need to give you a very detailed uh, introduction, but <laughs> nevertheless, I need to, I need to say that uh, Street on the Hill was her debut anthology. Her first novel is Unity in My Head. The second was the Hindi, which was short, long-listed for the Man Asian Literary Prize and short-listed for the Hindu Literary Prize. And the third was Difficult Pleasures, which was again short-listed for the Hindu Literary Prize. She's, I think it's still another book book section of character. Right? Yeah. So, uh, can we have everybody up there and start? Parvati's novel, of course, is very much a daily novel. Um, and they're both young. <laughs> this is uh, Parvati's debut novel, and of course, this new first book. So I'm going to leave them to do the talking, but yes, I very much want to say a few things about both books. Um, when Sarita Vinani of TFA asked me if I would uh, launch the books and say a little bit about them, I agreed immediately. Partly because um, I like involving myself in what TFA does, but also because uh, I've been following now for a few years the writings of young people, um, partly through TFA's work attending events, but I've also been conducting creative writing workshops, uh, mostly in Bangalore, for the last five or six years. Young people more and more want to write, so they write to older writers, they want to share their work. So over the last five or six years, I feel I'm starting to get a sense of the landscape of what young people are writing. And also what young people aspire to write. And the questions always are uh, very simple, very basic. How to write and what to write about. Right? Those are the questions that people, young people ask when they're starting out. Um, and simple as they are, these questions are always very, very difficult to answer. Because I think... Um, when young people start, their feeling is that writing is a technical business. It's a matter of cracking something, it's a matter of finding out the formula, and therefore the how question, how do I write? Do you need discipline? Should you sit at the table every day? Uh, and I try to tell them these are all important issues, but they're really secondary to the, to the how. And to the question of what to write, I'm of the school that believes that this is a, a, a dash or a piece of advice that a lot of people get when they go to creative writing courses. Let's start with what you know. Write what you know. Write about what's close to you. And this is the advice that I in turn try to give a lot of young writers that draw from what is in your immediate environment. Now this is not easy to follow. This is not easy advice to follow. Um, partly because you may, may not even have an existence that you think is 
worthy of, of drawing into fiction or drawing into poetry. And I often think of this cartoon I once saw in a magazine where two women are standing outside a classroom and uh, obviously it's a creative writing school and one woman is telling the other, uh, we are asked to write what we know but all I know are creative writing classes. Right, so how do you, if you think your life is banal and prosaic and insignificant, how do you make that the subject of your writing? And when I say make that the subject of your writing, I don't necessarily mean autobiography. Uh, I mean how do you create literature, how do you create writing out of autobiography? And that's that's one step to remove from just like, you know, vomiting a kid out on the page. It's about recreation. So in that slightly random context that I'm outlined, it was very, very interesting to read Mihir's book and to read Parvati's book. Because I think both of them in different ways are drawing on their own experience, are drawing on their particular situations, on their particular locations, and they're both very, very self-aware writers. They're both writers with a very clear sense of who they are and where they are. Mihir's work I got to know actually just a few months ago when he wrote to me and said uh, he's writing a few poems and he would like me to read a few poems and I said send me a bunch of good poems which he did and I immediately took to that set of poems that he sent me because these were poems about growing up they were, they were poems about ordinary life they were poems about the everyday and in my own work and my own reading and in my own aesthetic I have a weakness for literature of the everyday um, and there's a whole, there, there is a whole strain of writing about the everyday and you have it starting from Chekhov who wrote about the Russian middle class, you have Art and Arayan who wrote about ordinary lives in a small town in Vietnam. Um, in poetry you have somebody like Philip Larkin say, uh, who writes about the ordinary. Um, Raymond Carver is a big influence on who writes about every everyday, very ordinary and interestingly, the important thing I think is when you talk about the everyday, and I saw that in the book poems immediately, is that the everyday is very connected to middle class life. Uh, you can't talk about the everyday so much when you're talking about very impoverished lives, because then it's a different kind of, it's a struggle. You know, when you like when you read a Ruin the Mystery novel, uh, Mystery writes a lot about very impoverished, very impoverished families. Uh, and or or Brimchan, something like Brimchan. And that's, but that's, that's very ordinary, but it's always a struggle. There's a, a different kind of drama in a lower class life, an everyday low class life, from a middle class life. And there's, there's a kind of quiet lyricism in the everyday of the middle class. And that is what I found in English poems. But added to this larger aesthetic of the everyday of the middle class, there's something else that adds weight to English poems, and that is, like I said earlier, this awareness of and that position is uh, here as the son of two people who are Sanskrit teachers. Both his parents are Sanskrit teachers. And they have quite a hard struggle existence. Uh, not from a privileged background, but work themselves uh, into the professional class, uh, both became teachers. So there is a sense of being belonging to a milieu where there are parents of a generation where English was not so important. These are people who are teachers, they're professionals, they belong to the middle class, but they're not necessarily people who read a great deal in English or speak a great deal in English. And then he reflects on his own position as somebody coming of age in a Bihar. He's from Bihar, which became Jharkhand when he was a child, and he's from a Bihar and a Jharkhand where suddenly now English is becoming more and more significant. So central to this larger sort of campus of being a middle class writer, it's also this question of what does it mean to be a writer in a milieu where I'm writing in English and uh, I'm beginning to be recognized for what I'm writing but my parents don't necessarily understand or, or even read what I'm writing. Can you not hear me? biography of him being belonging to the class that he does and he has a wonderful essay which I'm not going to try and summarize. At the beginning of the book, I believe Parvati and, and we 
I can talk about it, but it's a fantastic piece of writing for somebody so young to have done. Uh, and he says somewhere in the essay, I think he says it in the first sentence, uh, that people were born in 1991, he said in the first sentence. And I'm trying to get my head around the fact that there is, it is possible for somebody to be born in 19, that almost seems like, <laughs> for somebody to be born in 1991 and have the self-awareness. Um, and he also, I think one of the poets you talk about, you have a phrase that's something like back in 2006. <laughs> No, I don't want to. I don't want to sound patronizing, but yeah, he, Mir is a very young writer, and he's uh, definitely going to uh, progress very interestingly. For me, the additionally interesting thing was I found echoes in that essay, especially with two other writers I admire, admire very much, who are also from Bihar. One is Amitabha Kumar, who I think has a fantastic sense of what it means to be Bihari in a Westernized, Anglicized world, and the other is Siddharth Chowdhury whose work is also very inflected about, with this consciousness of what does it mean to be a Bihari in contemporary India, especially in Delhi. Um, and I'm not suggesting something like a Bihari school of writing here. I don't want to like pigeonhole here. But there's definitely something in the idiom, a, a quality of plain speaking, a quality of irony, a quality of lack of illusions, that I found very strongly in that essay and in his words and the work of these two writers. Um, and both of them ask themselves what does it mean to be a Bihari in their fiction, implicitly, in a very creative and a very, you know, it's not a cut and dry question, it's a way of making sense of, of their place in the world. And Amitabha does it particularly in his latest book, A Matter of Rats, a short biography of Patna, which is really less a biography and more an autobiography. So that, that's Mir's work and, and those are the questions you ask. Parvati Sharma's book, Close to Home, is also asking some very, very interesting questions. And Parvati's book, interestingly, is also about the middle class. But this it is a much more privileged, a much more anglicized middle class. It's a Delhi middle class, which to my mind means it's like in the class of itself. It's, it's, it's very insular. Um, and her book really is about a woman who belongs to this class and is trying to sort of come of age in a way uh, in this milieu. And she's trying to come of age through finding uh, you know, love, through romantic relationships, through um, writing, she's writing a novel, through sympathy for the working class, should she patronize her, patronize her servants? Uh, should she help fund the education of her servants' child? So these are the various ways in which Prilani Singh, the, the central character of Parvati's book, is asking herself, who am I and how do I, how do I make sense of my, my life in Delhi and in this class? And the most striking thing to me about this book is Parvati's wonderful ease with the idiom of this class and this belief. And a lot of writers, again, I'm saying this because through my experience of doing creative writing workshops and talking to younger writers, is the difficulty of writing dialogue. There, there are writers, I and mean, even older writers, more experienced writers, who do anything to avoid dialogue. Because dialogue can be the as, as a lot of writers in the audience would know, dialogue can be the hardest thing to write. How do you get the sound, not just people speaking, but the sound of people speaking and the differences in their voices? And the wonderful thing about, about Parvati's novel is that she revels in dialogue. The whole novel is almost entirely dialogue. And you notice how characters change, how their feelings for each other are being modulated through the dialogue without her actually being heavy handed and giving us a lot of information and all that. That's a very, very skillful thing. So I'm amazed at how quickly she's developed as a writer. This is her first novel and um, it's obviously the first of, of many, but it's already a very mature work in a sense of the way people talk to each other. And this could be a two-year-old child, she's wonderful I think with, with the way a child talks, with the way a servant talks to his employer, with the way a couple talk in bed, she's really good with the range of the way people talk. And for me that is what like really led the novel along for me, a feeling for, for the way people talk. But in addition to that, there's also, there are also harder questions. 
questions. And these questions, then it's not necessarily only a literary project, right, to write a novel. It's also to my mind a moral project. You're asking questions about what is right and wrong, what should people do, uh, how do you make sense of life, uh, what is valuable. And I think it's really a question, it's really a question before Brilani, what values should I have? And because she belongs to a very privileged society and a very privileged uh, section of society, and she's in this marriage where everything's really provided for, she doesn't have to lift a finger. Because she's so materially secure, the questions become, what else do I really need to believe in? Because everything else seems, it seems dispensable in a way. It seems very you know, ambivalent. Should she fund the education of her daughter? Will that make her more meaningful and a better person? Should she go out and get a job? Should she write this novel? And I found that really funny how writing a novel also becomes a way of trying to ask what will make me more credible as a woman in 21st century India? So those are some of the questions. What values should I have? And everything is up for questioning. It's really like everything's unstable. That's the word I was looking for. Everything's unstable because you don't really need to make a living. Because then everything is taken care of. Like you're never going to hit rock bottom. So everything else seems you know, love, art, religion, everything else seems um, yeah, unstable. So those are the questions she's asking and uh, it's really a novel about how do liberated people in modern India lose their bearings. Once they've lost their bearings and their moorings, how do they find them again through what means? Uh, so I've said enough and I don't want to preempt what uh, Miri and Parvati wanted to talk about but I hope you enjoy the discussion and I hope you're going to read because I would really like to listen to the, to the sound of the voices in your novel and your books. Thank you very much.
So, so this was elephants. And I'm going to tell you something more about Hazari work. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a town of coal mines. So when I say that there are, there are rivers with carrying shiny traces of a mineral, so this is what I mean that the mineral is coal, iron ore, which is an abundance in that lake, largest mineral producing state, and yet being so poor in its own. So, uh, the, this, it starts from, uh, uh, what I'm trying to do actually is uh, draw a chronology, uh, taking from the myths of uh, tribal people who live in the river, mixing in the uh, colonial aspect of development which was carried out in Jharkhand and resulting in a lot of mines, a lot of land loss, and then how these people, these native people who are losing their lands, are coping up with it. The elephant comes handy because elephants are indigenous to the island. And elephants are one of those largest animal species that you find in the And they are just everywhere. With the destruction of forest, lots and lots of elephants do come sometimes to the town, do meander into the villages and they just destroy the harvest. So it's very much like that English man who went in the search for coal, who went in the search of iron, aluminium, uh, and then he went into the forest and then he turned into this greedy uh, kind of uh, capitalistic uh, and entrepreneur. And then how that comes through the nature of the elephant and how that, through the elephants, returns to haunt the villages. And these elephants are destructive. So this is what the poem was basically about. I wanted to write a biography of the Zariba in a very, in one page. And that's how it came out. So, that's it. Do, do you want, do you have any questions or something? Yeah. So, the first poem was elephants. The second poem is one art 1995. So this one is a reflection of a photograph, on a photograph, which I found in a family album uh, a couple of years ago. So in that photo, I, I'm very little because it's 95, I was born in 91, so that's four years old. <laughs> and uh, the photo is with my father. And my father doesn't live in Hazaribagh, he is a professor in Bihar. There is a place called Saharsa and he cannot transfer to Jharkhand. Neither my mom can transfer to Bihar. So he was always a kind of a visitor in our house. Where my mother and I meet the house and my father would come visit us for a while and then we would go back. So in 1995, my mother and I and my father went to this place called Ponar Dam. It's uh, 50 kilometers from Hazaribagh. It's a very pretty place. And there was this photo where I'm wearing these colorful clothes and my father is sitting there. And, and that's perhaps one of the very rare photos where uh, the family is together. And, uh, and, and, and there's a strange sense of warmth in that photo. There was a strange sense of warmth in that photo which somehow I don't find it uh, in, in, in my in, like, in this time. So I'm going to read Ponar 1995. So there it is. Uh, we sit in an abandoned park, holding hands and smiling. The trees stoop beside the water channels, and your fingers, big and firm against mine, define the touch as an assurance of safety. It's March, silent pole against an electric sun. We do not expose questions in front of the bushes, but hide them under laughter, like an artist painting a red circle white as the head. I want to tug at your sleeve and show how happy we are, that I am the toddler in the bright yellow overalls, growing up to write this poem. I want to tell you my mother's face is not right today. Look how she curls her arm around my tiny shoulders. And how you, reclining on the grass, with the river flowing behind, are not 40 
Yeah. So when we were turned 40 or around 45, the division of Bihar and Jharkhand would happen and that would just drown my mother and my father to their own towns. And that was where the separation would happen, like the end of it. So this is what this poem was about. And uh, I, I do hope that you have some questions, do you? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, this poem also has the title of the objection in it. And, uh, and when you were speaking earlier, you had uh, explained what and why you were choosing this title. And uh, I think, it, I think uh, there also, there were, the title also reflects something of the organization of the book, right? So, you know, that, yeah. so uh, uh, like you see, the title takes from this poem, Bernard Nehru and Defy, and uh, the poem goes to the past, and uh, but it's still narrated in the present voice. So the narrator is still in this time, and who is contemplating about this photo, which is from the past. And this is what happens, that when, when you tell in the autobiography, and you said that, it's, it's not an easy task, because you have to think of what, how much do you put out, put yourself out in there, right? And how much do you reveal, how much do you hide, what do you tell, and how, and to what extent should you shield yourself, the autobiographical, into becoming a uh, literary piece of work. So, painting that in a certain way, in the point of view as, 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 a, as a phrase, it signifies a kind of hiding, that we do not expose questions in front of the bushes, but we hide them under laughter like an artist who is painting a red circle white. Now, I also want to tell you that uh, because I, these poems dwell much on memory and from adolescent memory and memory is very, uh, you know, mutable. Like, uh, it, it mutates and, uh, and it can change itself uh, as we grow up. And what we do is something or the other that doesn't make sense. We concoct a fiction and we plant it into that memory to make sense of it. So it's also kind of fabrication in a sense where you want to arrive at a meaning and then you're thinking that how do I get there? I have this incident and I want to take something out of that. But memory is blurred and you cannot rely on it. So sometimes what you do is you fiction It's not only hiding, but it's also creating a canvas, the white canvas, for something new to come out of it. Or it's also a kind of a replacement, like what I was making, that earlier it was something original, and now something else is being stuck there. So it does look uniform, but you know that it's not uniform. So you know, you can see those edges. And you can see that even if it's all complete, those edges are very vision, visibly marked. And this is where I think memory plays its role. And this is where memory when we say it's unreliable. And it's also very interesting. Because it helps us reach where I think uh, in, in uh, uh, it helps us with those incidents which we realize carry certain significance only later in life. And I can say that this is much of the premise of this book. To go back and understand that what happened. And what happened to me, what happened to the Hariva, what happened to Jharkhand, what happened to my family. And taking that out into the world and hoping that someone would connect to it, someone would recognize those.